Good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, he comes to us from um, college in Texas, medical school in Texas, actually being born in Texas, and then um, residency training in Phoenix. He diverted to the east to get his gate GI training at uh, Children's Hospital of Cincinnati and then back to Texas, and in 2009, uh, he joined our division, where he is now a professor of pediatrics, and I'm certainly very glad he come, came. He's a very valuable member, a great clinician, and he does his best to organize uh, 10 gastroenterologists in their clinical operations. You're going to see a very distinguished gentleman come up and give a, and you will hear a great talk on uh, carbohydrate-induced diarrhea. But this is the real John Pohl. He is the gastro cowboy, and that black rope he's holding is the endoscope that he's ready to use. So um, without any further delay, I'd like to invite John to come to the podium and uh, proceed. OK, I've set you up in many ways. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, for that uh, kind introduction. There's very few people that I would dress up uh, with a cowboy hat and hold a scope for, and you're one of, the, one of those people. So. so my grand rounds will be on the diagnosis and management of carbohydrate-induced uh, diarrhea. This is an interesting uh, slide set. The North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition has decided to put together grand round slides about issues that we think are pertinent for our country, and we're going to be presenting these in various grand round settings, and this is one of the first ones that will be done. This is one of the first slide sets that have been put together, uh, which I was one of the people who worked on putting this whole slide set together. There are going to be more slides forthcoming in the next few years, I would imagine. So here are the people who are all involved uh, in terms of writing these slides. Uh, we all participated in putting in some of these slides, and we all reviewed together. The chair was Robert Schulman over at Baylor College of Medicine, and then there were people uh, from around the world who were involved as part of our society. The learning objectives, just to explain the pathophysiology of carbohydrate-induced diarrhea and to look at uh, current diagnostic approaches. And then once you know what's going on, provide individualized and appropriate management uh, needs to meet patient needs, and then education for patients and parents for long-term care. In terms of disclosures, uh, educational support was provided by QIL Medical and uh, NASPKIN, the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, and the NASPKIN Foundation do, does not endorse any product. We may talk about products, but we do not endorse any product. Faculty disclosures, I'm the one who has to disclose. Uh, I'm doing some work uh, with uh, NIDDK uh, as part of a big multicenter study looking at a current recur acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis in children, and I am on the Speakers Bureau for Medical Education Resources, none of which have anything to do with this talk. So let's talk about carbohydrate-induced diarrhea. Just basic organic chemistry review. Your monosaccharides, you have glucose, galactose, fructose. Glucose and galactose are six carbon uh, molecules, and the only difference between glucose and galactose is at position four of the carbon at the hydroxy group in terms of its shape. It's an epimer, either pointing down or up. Fructose, on the other hand, is a uh, four-carbon uh, molecule. And then you start moving on, and they hook up, and you either can get disaccharides or starches. Uh, lactose is then as the uh, combination, uh, a disaccharides of galactose and glucose. Sucrose, on the other hand, is a, a combination of glucose and fructose, and then long chains of glucose form starches, which are obviously quite long. Complicated slide, but I'll go through it quickly. In terms of how these are broken down, leads to the pathophysiology. For example, if you look at something like lactose, it gets broken down by lactase. The glucose and galactose can go through SGLT1, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is co-channeled with sodium for absorption. Sucrose, when it's broken down by sucrase, the fructose will go through uh, GLUT5, which can be rate dependent. On the other hand, when you're dealing with longer starch molecules, they are broken down as well. And then as they broke down to the individual glucose molecules that are absorbed, and then that goes through the villi, and then into the bloodstream through the enterocyte. 
Well, let's talk about the disaccharides. They are in the microvilli, sticking right through the membrane, uh, active right through the lumen. And there's two classes. There's alpha and beta galactosidases based on the type of chain that they break. Most of them are alpha uh, glycosidases except for lactase, which is a beta uh, glycosidase. Now, what happens with malabsorbed carbohydrate? What causes all those problems that we see? Well, if you're getting com not completely digested carbohydrates, they will pass into the colon, and of course, waiting there are bacteria. And bacteria will ferment that, and you will get lots of things. You can get hydrogen and methane gas, and that causes lots of things. The big thing, it gets excreted uh, in the breath, and that's the basis of the breath hydrogen test. Some of the breakdown will go into short-chain fatty acids. Now, short-chain short fatty acids by themselves can be very helpful in terms of being a, a, a feeding source for uh, uh, colonocytes. It's very helpful in terms of their, uh, uh, their growth. But these short-chain fatty acids are osmotically active, and that causes some of the diarrhea. Hence, if you're having malabsorbed dietary carbohydrates, you will get uh, an increase in fermentable substrate. At the same time, you get this increased osmotic load, just like we talked about, and that causes gas and a lot of fluid, and that causes the problems that you'll see in your clinic or in the ER or in the urgent care of these children presenting with diarrhea, bloating. Older children will complain of pain, increased flatulence. So signs and symptoms of carbohydrate malabsorption, unfortunately, nonspecific. I mean, these could be other things as well, but these things to start thinking about when you're thinking this might be carbohydrate malabsorption, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, and flatulent. Uh, failure to thrive can occur. It is rare. It's typically in infants with specific disorders, which we're going to go through some of these, some of these specific disorders. History uh, is very important. It's really important to know about the age that these patients are presenting if you think they have carbohydrate carbohydrate malabsorption because it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. And then a careful nutritional history. And I have found that a careful nutritional history does not take very long, but just asking very pointed questions is very helpful. What do we mean by age? And again, we're going to go through specific cases to give you an idea. But in the first week of life, you worry about some things that are quite serious. Glucose galactose malabsorption, congenital lactase deficiency. Congenital lactase deficiency is extremely rare. All of these are rare, but that's very rare. And sucrase isomaltase deficiency. As you start progressing into older infancy, three to six months, you may have fructose malabsorption. Again, sucre sucrase isomaltase, more benign or a less severe form may uh, present at that time. And then after the age of three, you can have problems with simple fructose malabsorption. And as you start progressing to the preteen, teen years, you can have adult onset lactase deficiency, which can start earlier. What about testing? Well, stool pH, typically less than 6. It's positive for reducing substances. Remember, reducing substances are positive only for glucose, galactose, and fructose, but not sucrose. Now, what can be happening if the bacteria break the uh, sucrose down to glucose and fructose, you may pick it up from that standpoint. But that's what the reducing substances are positive for. And then you can also measure your osmotic gap, and it's one of these um, one of these equations as gastroenterologists, we know your measured osmotic gap, or your measured osmolality minus two times your stool sodium plus your potassium. Uh, some la some uh, hospitals do not have the capacity to measure stool osmolality. We do it here, but if you don't have the capacity, you can essentially assume 290 most of the time to get your equation. And then if it's greater than 100, you have uh, a malabsorption. All right? You also want to rule out inflammatory processes. This may involve endoscopy, which we'll talk about later. There are certain tests we are just bringing up to your attention. Occult blood may be important. Uh, there is fecal calprotectin, uh, which is, uh, uh, measures inflammation. It's released into the stool. It's protein in the stool. Uh, keep in mind it is age dependent. So in other words, babies normally can have high calprotectin levels, and it kind of goes down to lower normals as you get older. And if it gets high, then it's much more sensitive. But just keep that in the back of mind. These are tests that can be done. Breath tests. Now, we're going to spend some time talking about breath tests because I want this concept to be understood. We don't do many breath tests here at Primary Children's because most of these kids we can pick up by history or we'll go on to en do endoscopy. But I think the uh, idea should be understood. So the whole idea with breath tests is that you have fermentation of malabsorbed carbohydrates. Remember, that comes into the colon. You get malabsorption. And then you get a rise uh, uh, of, your, uh, of hydrogen over time, over a certain period of time compared to baseline. So how does that work? Well, let's say, for example, you're doing a breath hydrogen looking for uh, 
lactase uh, deficiency. Um, you take some lactose, it goes into the small bowel, you get malabsorbed, goes to the colon, the colon at that point, are, the bacteria in the colon at that point are going, okay, this is a lot of very good bacteria or a lot of uh, good nutrition for us. We'll go ahead and uh, metabolize that, and then you get uh, a fermentation and a large amount of hydrogen is produced, and then you measure that in your breath. And so if it's greater than 20 parts per million, uh, you have malabsorption. Well, what happens in that setting is this classic uh, double bump that you see here. So this is a positive lactose hydrogen breath test. So what you do, you have this early peak due to small bowel bacteria utilizing this and producing hydrogen, and then you have this later peak as this stuff enters into the colon. And so, and it's really very interesting when you do these, you almost always will see a very obvious uh, double bump if this is done right. Diagnosis, well, dietary exclusion. This is often nonspecific because you can't always tell what's going on in terms of what's causing the problem, and you can get a, a subjective response. For example, if you have developmental lactase deficiency, so for example, uh, if someone was sick with gastroenteritis, may have a different response than two weeks later when their villi have healed. However, I use dietary exclusion quite a bit in my clinic for uh, relatively benign disorders as I'm trying to make a diagnosis. So jejunal biopsy or duodenal biopsy. Really very helpful. And this is something we do in our endoscopy suite. You have to, uh, at that point, you can get some histology as well, but also measure disaccharidase activity. And commonly, we do sucrase, lactase, and maltase, although isomaltase is looked at as well. It is a gold standard for many of these disorders, the big one being sucrase isomaltase deficiency. And then, as I said here, it requires proper handling and processing of the biopsy. Absolutely. When we get these biopsies for disaccharidase analysis, we have to get this on ice almost immediately be, or else you get uh, degradation and can get uh, uh, abnormal results. So we're going to spend the rest of this grand rounds going through specific cases. Some of these are very rare, but I want you to be aware of them. Some of them are relatively common. And we have some cute pictures of kids, which always helps. First thing we're going to do is glucose to galactose malabsorption. Now here's Alice. She's very cute. She's a one-week-old African-American female. She's discharged on the day after delivery, and the parents note almost right away that she's having watery diarrhea. So what do we note about this? Well, glucose, galactose malabsorption. Diarrhea is typically in the first week of life, and it's a selective malabsorption of both glucose and galactose. We'll talk about the pathway in a second. It is autosomal recessive. Parents often will have no symptoms, and you can see a history of consanguinity. And there's a molecular basis. Remember earlier in that cartoon, and I'll show it again, uh, SGLTL1 gene causes the problem with the tr co transporter of sodium and glucose coming in at the same time. So, here we go, for example. So, here is a patient having perhaps lactose or having starch right here. It gets broken down, and the glucose is supposed to be co absorbed with the sodium through SGLT1, and that is normal. But in the mutation with glucose galactose malabsorption, you have a problem with sodium absorption coming at the same time, and you subsequently get malabsorption and very severe symptoms. Complicated slide here, but just to show you, there's lots of mutations that have been discovered with this. Very complicated. How do these patients present? Well, osmotic diarrhea, just like we talked about earlier, first week of life, very severe. You will have metabolic acidosis, and of course, you will have the uh, uh, stool pH less than six. That makes sense. Stool positive for reducing substances, increased osmotic gap, all those things we talked about. You may have a sibling with a similar history, but not as severe. The other thing that's very interesting is these patients can have glucosuria. These mutations of SGLT1 can also be in the proximal tubule, so you may see that as well. Now, these small bowel biopsies are going to be normal because it's more of a channel defect, but you will note a selective malabsorption of glucose and galactose. Now, you can do gene testing, and that's typically going to be recommended if you're thinking this is where you're going, but th what's also helpful is just really looking at what this baby is doing. What are they taking in? How much are they pooping out? And then you can try various formulas. And I won't go through all this here, but basically this makes sense, right? If you have a carbohydrate-free formula, you're not going to get diarrhea with these babies. And you put the babies on this, and they get better. You can do glucose breath testing, something we don't do here, but you can do SGLT1 gene sequencing. If we have a baby with that, we could have that sent out. So what about long-term treatment? Well. This is not something that's going to get that much better over time. So you basically have them on a modified Atkins diet. Uh, you have to be careful with galactose. Cause remember, it's a monosaccharide primarily in uh, lactose. There have been some reports, uh, and these are just reports, that 
there gets to be some glucose tolerance uh, with age. And then for the first 12 months of life, we typically keep them on a carbohydrate-free formula uh, with fructose to meet your carbohydrate energy requirements. You have to be careful when solids are introduced. Now, obviously, you're going to do pureed foods. That makes sense. Make sure you have things that are glucose-free uh, and then are fructose-based and are just with protein and fat. And many patients will stay on this carbohydrate formula uh, for about 12 months, and some pa patients will go on beyond that, but that's not always needed. And then, of course, as always, because of the inability to take things like milk, adequate dietary calcium uh, by supplementation is required. Dietitian, some of my, my, some of my favorite people at Primary Children's. Um, these people can be, these professionals can be very, very helpful. Uh, multiple visits will be required around, uh, with education, like many of this, these disorders we're talking about, and just parents need to be very familiar with this. And of course, much like other things in life, such as celiac disease, it's very easy to manage the diet early, diet early in life, but as a child gets older and starts experimenting, enters the adolescent years, this can be a problem. And so glucose intake becomes more difficult as children get older. Now, parents should be encouraged to explore some level of glucose tolerance as these kids become older because patients sometimes can have better glucose tolerance over time. Keep in mind that liquid medicines are dissolved in glucose-based syrup, and so crushed tablets are recommended. And just because you have them on a high-fat, high-protein diet, uh, you're not going to have to worry about obesity with this problem, with this uh, disorder. Okay, so it's okay keeping them in this situation, keeping them on a high-fat, high-protein diet. So, what happened to cute little Alice? Well, her, she was known to have a low stool pH. Uh, she was uh, diarrhea was induced with glucose-containing formula, and she was diagnosed with glucose galactose malabsorption. And then she was placed on a carbohydrate formula, uh, free formula, which caused uh, market improvement. And then the parents received extensive education. So she did very well. So as I said, we're going to do some things that are pretty rare and some things that are pretty common. And we're going to mix it up a little bit just to do some, uh, some education here. So fructose malabsorption. Well, here's Manny. Manny's 12 years of age. He has bloating, uh, pain, and excessive flatulence after eating. And what does Manny like to eat? Well, he likes fruit juice. I don't know if Manny likes fruit, but it says he likes fruit. He likes fruit juices. He likes soft drinks. He likes pizza. So there's Manny. So dietary fructose, it can be really uh, quite a large part of our diet. Uh, you can see it in high fructose corn syrups. Uh, you can see it in all sorts of bread products, such as uh, pizza, pasta, cakes, and breads. Intake in the United States is really quite high. Uh, 49 grams a day for the average American, that's actually really very high. And two-thirds are typically from drink, uh, from drinks and one-third from fruit. Now, this is a, uh, this is not necessarily, a, a, this is not a mutation of GLUT5. We don't really know what causes fructose malabsorption. It may be just an inability of the colon to, or the intestine to handle, or the colon to handle fructose well. There may just be some patients who reach a limit and they have a problem. So we don't understand what causes, but we know it exists. And what's interesting is absorption capacity increases with age. To some degree, it kind of matches chronic nonspecific diarrhea or toddler's diarrhea, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So malabsorption is directly related to the dose because we have a limited ability to transport fructose. Now, uh, interesting that GLUT5 that helps uh, with absorption of fructose uh, is inducible. So if you slowly increase your fructose uh, intake, you can have some capacity to have less symptoms over time. But malabsorption is uh, most commonly seen when you have a pretty big consumption of a greater than 15 milliliters per kilogram, which can be quite a large amount of fructose. One thing I want to keep in mind here, I think this slide is very important. When we talked about fructose malabsorption, this is not hereditary fructose intolerance. These are completely different disorders. Hereditary fructose intolerance is a significant liver problem. Uh, which can lead to death and liver, fa liver failure and death. So uh, these are different disorders. So clinical presentation, you know, presentation really is typically uh, related to the amount of fructose ingested and therefore your sensitivity. And there appear to be differences among people in their ability to absorb and or ferment fructose that reaches the colon. And these patients will stick out, increase flatulence, a vague abdominal pain, bloating, and then uh, ingestion of fructose just by itself, and we'll talk about this in a second, are more likely to induce symptoms than when ingested at the same time with glucose. So there is the, uh, you can do breath testing. Uh, 
we don't do the breath test for that here. And be honest with you, most of the time, you can just get this just off the simple history. But I do want to talk about that. You can do uh, fructose malabsorption, where you can give some fructose. And again, you'll see that greater than 20 parts per million over baseline to uh, give you the positive test. Now, a positive breath test may be reliable, but response to fructose alone may not reflect what happens when it's ingested with a meal. So a patient may say, I'm having a lot of problems with fructose. But when you talk to them, they may not be taking that much fructose in, or they may be taking a lot in and not having that many symptoms. Treatment for this is eliminate foods in which fructose is the sole or main carbohydrate. And then keep in mind that not all high fructose corn syrups may cause uh, symptoms. Remember we talked about earlier is that if you have glucose at the same time, it's very helpful. So if you look at things like high fructose corn syrup 42, which is 42% fructose with an excess of glucose, uh, you will have less symptoms because you have that glucose that helps with absorption when, with, a, with, a, with a fructose malabsorption. So this leads on, goes on to FODMAP diets, which is helpful for this. I think we've all heard about FODMAPs. It's a long name, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyoils. These things are everywhere, and they're poorly absorbed, rapidly fermented. You worry about fructose of these things. Elimination from the diet has been shown uh, in many studies, mostly adult studies, to be very helpful for irritable bowel syndrome in adults. The studies in children are there. They're not as clear, but I think it makes sense to be helpful as well. So FODMAPs are hard to avoid. I mean, look at this list. A lot of stuff, right? But if you can get someone to do this in certain settings, it can be very, very helpful. I put some pictures here as well, just to kind of give you an idea. It, in terms of how you do this, the general recommendation is to take these foods out of the diet with the help of a dietitian, and then slowly introduce some of these foods back at a time to see if there's a threshold that is reached. And then once you reach that threshold, you stay below that threshold. I think when I look at this, that that's a lot of food. So maybe they should, they should just drink water. <laughs> but but uh, no, but it does, it does seem to make a difference. So Manny, so he had a positive breath test for fructose malabsorption. At the same time he was doing breath testing, he also had uh, bloating and pain. And then uh, he did an exclusion diet, which caused the symptoms to go away. Lactase deficiency. So here's Miles, 15-year-old male, uh, diarrhea abdominal pain and bloating within one to two hours of eating, and no weight loss or any other constitutional symptoms. So lactose is present in milk and other dairy products. I know we know that. When I talk about removing milk from the diet, I have to remind people that uh, ice cream, cheese, and yogurt, and I'm really actually shocked actually how many times people don't realize that, so I have to be very clear that uh, lactose is in other products. So. As you probably are aware, lactose is hydrolyzed by lactase uh, floors and hydrolase at the tips of the villi. And you can see there with immunostaining, you can see um, uh, the lactase all present at the tips of the villi there. Very beautiful picture. So lactase deficiency can be primary or secondary. I really don't worry very much about primary. It's just incredibly rare. Uh, in, in babies, unless you get older and there's some ethnic variations we'll talk about, but pr uh, primary lactase deficiency in infants is almost unheard of. But they're secondary. Anything that would cause mucosal injury, anything that would cause bacterial overgrowth, anything that would cause an uh, intraluminal infection, these are things you need to think about. In terms of uh, primary congenital lactase uh, deficiency, it's rare, most cases from Finland, diarrhea from birth. And they have absent lactase activity when you do disaccharides analysis, but everything, uh, everything is otherwise fine. And just by the way, this is something that I uh, get quite a bit. I, I've had people say, well, uh, I took, uh, I put the child on a uh, lactose-free formula uh, because I was worried about cow's milk protein allergy. These are completely different issues. This is a uh, carbohydrate issue. Cow's milk protein allergy is a protein. So keep that in the back of your mind. So lactase activity in utero increases primarily in the last trimester. But premature infants born before 32 weeks have reduced lactase activity. And lactase activity decreases uh, after weaning in all mammals, except for humans, which have persistent uh, lactase activity, which is interesting. Lactose, uh, lactase persistence uh, is defined by the ability to digest lactose as an adult. Now, most of the world will go on and develop over time lactase deficiency. Various polymorphisms have been described, and I'm not going to go into theirs, but there's some very interesting, uh, interesting ones out there. For example, uh, there's a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, 
13910, which is associated with uh, lactase persistence in uh, European populations. It's about a 5,000, 12,000 year old mutation. It may have something to do with the introduction of farming and domesticating animals from a, from a uh, civilization standpoint. And there's a variation. And you can look here, Northern Europeans, the prevalence, uh, if you look at adults having uh, lactase deficiency, to 15%. But as you work your way down, Af uh, American Indians, Native Americans, 80 to 100%. Asians, 95 to 100%. African Americans, 60 to 80%. So there's high risk uh, ethnic groups. So just keep in mind when we talk about lactose intolerance versus malabsorption, they're often used uh, interchangeably. For example, some patients actually may have some degree of lactase uh, deficiency, but may have no symptoms or minimal symptoms. And some people may say, I'm really lactose intolerant. You check, they may not have that many problems. And adults, typically lactose intake uh, limited to 240 milliliters a day causes minimal symptoms. Again, breath test, something to do here for lactose malabsorption. Um, it, it can be done. Uh, and lactose intolerance frequency varies less among different ethnic racial groups than does lactose malabsorption, okay? And then frequency of lactose malabsorption is low in children, but it peaks between 10 to 16 years of age. How do these patients present? Well, stop me if you've heard this before. They have bloating, abdominal pain, increased gas, diarrhea, maybe vomiting. And actually, I, that sounds odd, but it, it's like it says, especially in adolescents, and it's been my experience that these kids have vomiting during the teenage years or just before. Uh, and there is significant intervariability uh, in symptoms. Some patients may have a significant problem with malabsorption. Some patients have minimal to none. Stool testing, again, low stool pH when you're having significant lactase deficiency. You'll have positive reducing substances. You can do the lactose breath hydrogen test. Again, that greater than 20 parts per million uh, bump over baseline. Keep in mind, false negatives, if you're taking antibiotics, right, that's going to potentially get rid of any type of bacterial overgrowth, so that can cause false negative, false positive, for example, if you're having rapid intestinal transit. So it comes down to if you really need to know, which most of the time you really don't need to know in this setting, but outside of just getting a good history and physical and making recommendations, but it's duodenal biopsy with disaccharidase analysis. And here you can see, now this is the gold standard. Now, most of the time when I have these patients come to clinic, I can recommend it and they can get better and I don't have to progress to this, but there are times that we would have to do that. And you should have normal histology but absent lactase. So here you go, you have immunostain right here for lactase on the tips of the villi, a nice pretty brown coloration, nice and beautiful villi. Here's the same, or here's another patient with lactase deficiency. Again, nice and beautiful villi right here, but no lactase. Treatment, uh, reducing uh, lactose intake, enzyme replacement, these are over the counter. Uh, you can either ingest prior or add to the food. Keep in mind that the, uh, these products do have incomplete uh, symptom relief. Some patients do quite well, some patients do not do well. Most of my patients do relatively well in between. Of course, you are taking out milk products, so you need to add, uh, maintain adequate calcium intake. And there's a recommend daily intakes that are well known. So Miles was diagnosed with hypolactasia. He had uh, over-the-counter lactase supplementation, and it helped him, and then had education. And there is his breath test right there. You can see that double peak. Congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency. I, this is very rare, but you know, I've been amazed since I've come here to Utah. We've collected a fair number. Dr. O'Gorman, my partner, has uh, kept up with a lot of these patients. I've been amazed how many patients are out there. So here's Sarah. She's an eight-month-old Caucasian female. Breastfed, two to three months of diarrhea and colicky uh, discomfort. Uh, her weight has gone down. No vomiting, and she has distension after feeding. So sucrose, remember it's got the glucose and fructose there together, is present in fruits and table sugar. And sucrose is hydrolyzed by sucrase osmaltase, which is on the length of the villi. And again, with immune staining, you can see the staining of that disaccharidase there. Now, congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency is rare. It's autosomal recessive. With ingestion of sucrose and oligosaccharides, you get uh, malabsorption, malabsorptive diarrhea. Common, relatively common in Greenland, uh, and 5% in Alaska and Canada, and about 0.02% of people of European descent. Simply, 
it's mutations to the sucrase isomaltase genes, which affects uh, the disaccharides. And there's several different phenotypes. There appears to be probably a spectrum from very severe to some patients that have very pretty mild symptoms that may be accidentally misdiagnosed as older irritable bowel syndrome. And these mutations will cause enzyme problems at multiple levels. This may be a processing issue. This may be a transport issue. Maybe a, a insertion of the enzyme to the brush border issue. There's all different sorts of mutations that are described. However, the typical presentation is in infancy, after weaning with introduction, introduction of uh, sucrase containing foods. And symptoms include failure to thrive, excessive gas, abdominal pain, diarrhea, malnutrition. These patients do have malnutrition for sure. Strangely, as they grow older, these children are able to tolerate increasing amounts of sucrose. And like I said earlier, many of these patients actually may be misdiagnosed as having irritable bowel syndrome, and they may go their entire life because they're not having any other issues, simply occasional diarrhea and abdominal pain, they may actually have irritable bowel syndrome. Again, you've heard this before, stool testing, the pH is less than 6. Breath testing can be done. But in this setting, for if you're really worried about sucrase isomaltase, I strongly recommend duodenal biopsy with disaccharides analysis, and you will see uh, absent sucrase activity and absent or a marked reduction in isomaltase activity with normal histology. Those villi are going to look normal except for this. We're unclear if milder forms exist. Treatment is adherence to a sucrose-free diet and reduction in starch as well, and like we talked about, as these patients get older, they have improved tolerance. Treatment, this is kind of exciting. There has been some uh, progress in treatment. Now, Baker's yeast, yeast has been used, uh, and it's been shown to be helpful, but it tastes nasty. I think I'm supposed to say not very palatable. That's translation for tastes nasty. Sacrosidase now is available. It has sucrase activity. It's approved by the FDA. It's an oral liquid solution. It's been amazing what this does for these babies who have this problem, and it tastes very good. It is expensive, and that's an issue working with insurance companies, but it does work. So Sarah, breath hydrogen testing was positive. I actually, in this setting, if she had bad fear of thrive, I would have gone on to do endoscopy first just to make sure there wasn't anything else going on. And she was noted to have sucrase isomaltase deficiency. Restricted diet was implemented with her. She did very well. And that's the end of her. Well, let's talk about two more problems. What about disaccharides deficiencies related to specific disorders? Well, here's Beverly. Four-year-old Indian-American female. She's had chronic diarrhea for five weeks. She's had abdominal pain and bloating. So we've talked about some of these things, these primary defects, like sucrase isomaltase deficiency, lactase deficiency. But what about something secondary, anything that's disrupting the mucosa or disordered motility, mucosal disease like celiac disease or IBD or food allergies or bacterial overgrowth? This is what we're talking about. So, for example, this is a cartoon that I made that I think is kind of I don't know how good it is, but it's okay. This is supposed to be a big dilated segment of bowel. And here's this baby with a stricture, and then you have this normal bowel lumen. So what happens right here? You get dilated bowel, you get stasis, bacterial overgrowth, you get secondary inflammation. That's going to cause disaccharides deficiency as your mucosa is disrupted due to inflammation. And here's an example. You can see the stricture there, and you see the dilated proximal bowel. And here's a stricture from a patient with Crohn's disease. Again, these are things that will cause the Crohn's disease in itself. It's going to cause inflammation and potential disaccharidase deficiency. But it doesn't help when you have some type of thing, some type of stricture that's dilating your bowel and causing bacterial overgrowth. And then, of course, mucosal disease, any inflammation, food allergies, IBD, celiac disease, giardi giardiasis, any type of inflammation. Here's an example of uh, eosinophilic disease from calcium protein allergy, and you can see Luckily, uh, when uh, the pathologist did the staining, the eosinophils came with arrows, which really helps a lot if the eosinophils come with arrows. Usually that's not the case, but you can, uh, yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> here's an example of Crohn's disease. Now, keep in mind with Crohn's disease, if it's pretty mild, you can initially present symptoms you think might be similar to irritable bowel syndrome. That's why you have to be pretty careful with your IBS patients. Make sure you're not missing anything else, like starting to lose growth parameters or maybe actually uh, passing blood. Here's a characteristic granuloma that we would see with Crohn's disease right there at the arrow. And then with the inflammation, you have decreased or uh, disaccharidase activity of the small bowel. So in this setting with Beverly, let's talk about celiac disease. So celiac disease was first diagnosed by uh, Guy in, in 1888. 
And it was later on in the 1950s that uh, Dyke and uh, Van de Kommer uh, entered, uh, uh, figured out that it was gluten or gliadin in particular, the protein that caused inflammation. And you see that in barley, uh, rye, oats, and all wheat-containing agents. So biopsy is the key to diagnosis. Uh, we can talk about antibody levels, and that's a whole other talk, but the key to diagnosis is biopsy, and you'll have a secondary disaccharidase deficiency. And you can see there what they call scalloping, these little cuts here in the lining of the duodenum that's very characteristic of celiac disease. And then what you will see then in the setting of celiac disease, remember those beautiful villi you saw in those earlier? Well, you don't see that. You have these areas where the villi are essentially non-existent, and you'll see a lymphocytic infiltrate, and that's what you need to see pretty much absent or shortened villi and a lymphocytic infiltration. And that's called Marsh criteria, and there's various levels of Marsh criteria to make the diagnosis for celiac disease. Busy slide. I'm going to tell you the short of this is that there's a lot of tests you can do if you think this is an inflammatory or obstructive or a motility process. You just put them there. But the big thing is you have to decide with these patients, do we need to go ahead and proceed with endoscopy with biopsy? In the setting of celiac disease, removal of gluten is essential, and lifelong adherence to a gluten-free diet is needed. Foods to avoid, well, I think you can find these things off the Celiac Disease Foundation website. I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of these issues here because this uh, information is ubiquitous, but wheat-containing items is what you need to avoid. Keep in mind, alcohol derived from grain, this becomes an issue uh, with adolescents and young adults with experimentation. Certain foods are allowed, those that are gluten-free. And again, very good information on the Celiac Disease Foundation website. So Beverly, very cute Beverly. The serum testing, tissue transglutaminase, IgA antibody uh, was positive. When she had an endoscopy, she had duodenal scalloping. And then, of course, that's not enough to make the diagnosis a lot suspicious, and so biopsies were done. She had findings characteristic of celiac disease. She was diagnosed with celiac disease. She was placed on a gluten-free diet and uh, did well. This is the last one that we have. This is pretty common. I have a lot of these kids sent to my clinic, um, and they're interesting to take care of because you don't have to do very much and they get better, but you should be aware that these kids exist. This is actually also, in the past few years, has been a board question for the, for the pediatric boards. So functional diarrhea, toddler's diarrhea, or chronic nonspecific diarrhea of infancy. I think a lot of people typically call this toddler's diarrhea. Here's Owen. And I think this is a good picture. I don't know who Owen is. This is a cute picture, but he just needs, like, some stain, some fruit stain. That would be perfect. Usually, right? This child comes in, they have a big fruit stain around their neck, and then you're okay. So two-year-old Caucasian male, intermittent diarrhea for the past three months. But, heck, he's been healthy. He has stools shortly after eating. His uh, stools are often described as mushy, mushy to watery. Uh, if you do your uh, prep questions, the question always is, the mother says the, I think they say the, the stool looks like a nightmare. It's always that same question every year. The stool looks like a nightmare. Uh, they, the child drinks a, uh, 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 drinks five to six cups of juice a day, a lot of juice. And then they talk to a friend about it, and they recommended a low-fat diet, and that made it a lot worse. So... Functional diarrhea, or what a lot of us call toddler's diarrhea, but really is, should be called functional diarrhea, it was first coined uh, in the 50s, and it was further uh, refined uh, as functional diarrhea in the 60s by Davidson and Wasserman. The interesting thing about it is that we know what it is. We know this is benign. We know these kids get better by reducing fruit and juice intake. But very little research has been done on this, mainly because these kids are really healthy. But we don't really know very much in terms of how, if a lot of these kids go on to progress to irritable bowel syndrome later on in life. Is there anything else going on? But these kids are very healthy, just have diarrhea. Now, what typically happens is an increase of poorly absorbed sugars, often from the fruit juice. And then these kids are often having a reduced intake of fat, protein, and fiber. Sometimes it's really hard to get the etiology. You have to spend some time with the parents and talk to them to figure this out. Uh, it's not always clear right at first. And sometimes I'll just say, even if I don't get that history, I'll have them try it anyway to eliminate juice. Fairly common. 12% uh, begins between birth and five months of age. As you start progressing uh, to toddler years, uh, the, a lot of the presentation, up to 75% of the presentation can be, be between six to 20 months of age. 
And by the time you reach the age of four and you start developing some tolerance, it's gone away. Often you'll hear the first tool of the day is often more formed than subsequent ones. Something that uh, I have learned through the years is I'll have parents tell me that uh, they might be sleeping in on a Saturday and they'll hear the kid in their crib kind of cooing, playing around, and there's just horrendously bad smell comes out and they've rubbed poop all over the, the bed sheets. And I've actually found that to be very helpful. And I've often found that that is when you talk to them, you get a diet history consistent possibly with functional diarrhea. So a daily, daily pa uh, painless passage of greater than three large uniform stool. Again, th though if that can be nonspecific at times. It says often foul-smelling. I would disagree. I think it's always foul-smelling. I've never heard of non-foul-smelling poo, but, but if you have heard of that, tell me that. Um, and then the last symptoms last for a while. Passage of stool during waking hours. I said they're really not having nocturnal stooling. And then they have really no failure to thrive as long as they're getting adequate calories. They're not losing weight. So they may be having a lot of diarrhea, but they're very healthy-looking kids. It's a uh, clinical diagnosis. It requires a very detailed history. If you need to, you can do diet diaries and things like that. I typically, what I've done through the years is I just kind of say, what does your child drink? What Does your child like to eat fruit? How much? Um, and then you need to exclude the possibility. You may not necessarily test for it, but you just need to exclude the possibility of enteric infection, antibiotic use, for example, if you're worried about uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea or C. diff, laxative use, celiac disease, and maybe an underlying disaccharidase deficiency. You may not necessarily test for this right at first if you have a good history, but just keep in mind these things. So history is critical. It's that excessive fluid and juice intake that causes the problem, and then a low fat intake. Keep in mind, some of these kids can also have food allergies at the same time, but in this setting, no. Once you're placed on a normal diet, most children uh, get better. And the big thing I just basically do is I really limit fruit and juice. That's my big thing I do. And I just say really try to add a lot of fat to their diet. And that, for me, through the years has worked. And I tell parents, you give it a couple weeks. Some kids get better right away. But you give it a couple weeks. Bulking agent, agents like uh, Fisilium, like what you've seen, Metamucil can help as well. Now, you know you cannot do a talk without the Bristol stool scale. I mean, it's just you got to do it. All right, okay. So you can have uh, parents uh, keep a diary for a week or two, and this is the Bristol stool scale. You can get these on, uh, online very, image, uh, very easily on Google Images and various websites, uh, and they can, have, they can kind of circle what they're seeing, and that can kind of give you an idea, and it can objectify the report. I don't do that. I just typically talk to them, and I can tell. They usually tell me it smells really bad, it gets everywhere, and the kid's really healthy. So balanced diet is very helpful. Talking with a dietitian with a family may be very helpful as well. It's very good to reassure uh, families that there is no really consequences of this disorder. There's some people who think that these kids may over time, a certain percentage of these kids may develop irritable bowel syndrome during their teenage years, but that's not really known very well. And then the utility of uh, keeping a diet diary, perhaps a stool diary, just to kind of make sure they're following the diet correctly. So cute little Owen, now the juice is definitely gone. See, there's no stain anymore. So his growth parameters are normal. Uh, blood was checked for pathogens, and there's no pathogens, no blood. He was diagnosed with functional diarrhea. He increased the amount of fat in his diet. The stool improved. And in this, this case, the parents were advised to keep a uh, diet and defecation diary. I typically don't do that, but that's one thing you can do. So in summary, carbohydrates are important especially in children. And malabsorption, especially some of these really severe disorders we talked about, creates a barrier to development. And then thinking about the diagnosis can establish a cause for symptoms and allowing appropriate treatment. And then education is needed, uh, especially with the child as they get older and with parents. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. 
Yeah, so that's a really great question. So the question then is about all the lactose-contained products that are out there, uh, like bread products and things like that, and how can you help families? I mean, unfortunately, I mean, simply and unfortunately, reading labels. And the good news is that we do a pretty good job in this country with our labels. Not perfect, but we do a pretty good job. So families are going to have to look at labels. I do think in complicated situations that dietitians are extremely helpful, uh, and I've had that uh, I've had that help. Pardon me, I've had that done uh, as well. So uh, I, I think that they just have to read labels, but if there's a question, a one time consultation with a dietitian can be very helpful. Depends on your insurance. Depends on your insurance. Uh, let's see, who raised you guys are together? I'm going to. You go ahead, Karen. Well, I mean, keep in mind, so your question was about uh, the, the developmental issues associated with celiac disease. The pro thing with celiac disease is that it, you know, it can occur throughout the age spectrum once there's gluten exposure, okay? So children much younger than that can be very sick with celiac disease. And, of course, there are adults who get diagnosed with celiac disease, you know, later in life. I don't understand why they went decades without a problem. I, mean, I understand why, but we don't know why you kind of reach a threshold where you have symptoms enough you start checking. And then, of course, there's the odd part, and um, this talk isn't really about celiac disease, but one thing that's really interesting about celiac disease is that, you know, we get a lot of kids that send to, get sent to us from the endocrine clinic as part of their screening of their type 1 diabetics, and these kids have positive tissue transglutaminase, IG antibiotics, who are having no symptoms whatsoever, and you scope them and they have it. So, you know, it's interesting. Go ahead. Yes. It's not that common. Yeah, so the question is how, how, how do you talk to parents about lactose intolerance uh, and, and toddlers? Yeah, this is, this is really uh, an education issue. Um, and I have seen the whole spectrum from um, parents not understanding it to older patients not understanding it to even some providers not understanding it. And so um, what I tell them is that in young children, unless there's a mucosal defect, like celiac disease or Crohn's disease, I mean, the, the chance that you're going to have lactase deficiency in a young child is almost unheard of. And then I make sure, because this is the one thing, I make sure they're not getting mixed up with cow's milk protein allergy. And that's the biggest, one of the big, as if someone who's a general gastroenterologist, one of the biggest conversations I have with families is, is making sure they understand the difference between protein and carbohydrates. I have found when I have brought up those issues if I think this is maybe more of a cow's milk protein allergy issue, when you kind of sit down and explain that, I get a lot further in conversations with families. Yeah. So the question is the carbohydrates and the thickening agents and aspiration causing diarrhea. You know, you're talking about something that I'm not very familiar with. That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if there's any protein alternatives. I guess the question would be, are all, let me ask you, are all of your children doing this having explosive diarrhea or just some? So the question is if some of them are having problems, then the question is, is there something going on with their intestinal tract. Does that make sense? Do they have an underlying disaccharides deficiency, a mucosal issue, some enteric infection? So those may be a kid. If you're finding a, a percentage, but not all, of these kids are having issues, that may be something to think about. Um, I will do more looking into that. That's actually a really good question. I've never thought about that. Great. That's a very great question. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Right. 
Right. So the question is, uh, in the ER setting when you have diarrhea, um, uh, when do you refer? Where's Dr. Varier? Is he here? There he is. In the best, see, there's Dr. Varier. I'm going to leave him down in the ER for the next five years, and then you can just <laughs> just tell, tell Laura. She'll be fine with that. No. Um, so, you know, if they – what I would do, if they're having longstanding chronic diarrhea and they're not having anything else that's worrisome, um, you may want to think about, you know, as you talk to them, for example, they're an older child and they have the uh, correct ethnicity, is this lactase deficiency, if this, is this maybe a toddler's diarrhea thing? And I would provide education. And by the way, uh, the, the educational arm of our society, it's called GI Kids. The website is gikids.org, has uh, tons of good handouts that you can give families for these problems. And I would probably refer back to the primary care physician and have them do a further workup. And then if it persists at that point, you can refer to GI. Does that make sense? Now, but if you're seeing something that's worrisome, loss of weight, potentially pooping blood, getting up in the middle of the night and pooping, nocturnal stooling, severe abdominal pain, yeah, you need to refer. And we're gastroenterologists. I mean, it's diarrhea. That's what we do, so whatever. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you for being such a nice audience.